Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Nice to see everyone today. It's a new week. Welcome, welcome. It is Monday, April 6th, 2020. Anybody get out of their pajamas this morning? Or is it just me? Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Hello, Katie. All the Katies in aquatics, say hello. Let me know that you're here. See what you're doing this morning. Hello, Carrie Allen. Andrea, Charlottesville, Virginia. If you're new here, let us know where you're from, location, so city, state, province. Um, and you're, so Katie says, you had to put on clothes so you're a teacher having video calls with your students starting at 10 a.m. So yep, same as me. I'm fully, I've got my clothes on, got my makeup on, fully awake. Um, so definitely good to get into a routine. I noticed with my neighbors, I was just out shoveling snow, if you can believe it. We had some snow this morning. Uh, my neighbor was out there with their dog in their pajamas and it's what 10 30 in calgary so no judgment but i need a routine i need to put on clothes to get this day going uh, we've got angela here from oakland maryland alicia's here from dublin california lots of dublins i recently uh, i follow dublin aquatics in ohio on instagram so all of the dublins uh, let us know where you're from if you're here good morning well if you're here of course you're here i'm here um i've got them blowing some snow in the background this morning so hopefully that won't interfere too much with us while we're starting prince george county maryland welcome catherine connor's here from costa mesa connor what's the temperature like in costa mesa today you know is it 70 fahrenheit 80 fahrenheit sunshine uh elizabeth is here from virginia so I posted on Instagram stories maybe two hours ago. I was doing some work and it was literally like wet snowflakes snow falling for probably two or three hours this morning. So rainy in Costa Mesa, but still warmer. So 65 Fahrenheit, probably like 10, 12 degrees Celsius. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple things I brought this morning. So, um, Today's topic will be accessibility. I don't have any accessibility resources planned. I should have obviously thought that a little bit better. Hello, Shandy from Canmore. I just brought some different resources that I like using when I'm teaching different classes. I thought I would continue to share that with you guys. So the first thing I wanted to show you, any class I go to, whether I'm teaching a certified pool operator class, whether I'm teaching a national lifeguard instructor class, whether I'm teaching a bronze medallion class, whether I'm teaching a first aid class, I think it's really important that we engage with our students and we understand that not everyone is able to sit like we are at a screen and listen, right? We have different learning styles. We have audio learning styles, visual learning styles, kinesthetic learning styles. And then we also have different presentation styles. Right now I'm direct delivering, talking to you guys. So super important that we also understand that the learning is processed through different ways. So I know I like to listen. We watch TV, my husband thinks I'm not paying attention, but I'm listening. So think about how can you engage with your students and have them listening to you, but still engaged and not on their phones. So I have a big bag of Play-Doh. Hello, Carrie from Dallas, Virginia. So it's 70 Fahrenheit in Virginia, but no snow. Uh, believe me, right now you don't wish you had snow when we're all homebound. So Play-Doh, okay? When was the last time you purchased Play-Doh? So there's no children in my household, but I purchased, these are the mini party packs of Play-Doh. They're quite small. You can get 50 of these at Costco at Christmas, or you can order these on Amazon. Um, different sizes. I like to give these out to my students in different classes. They are intended to be given back to me, but if they're gross or they take them home, that's perfectly okay. But this is, I can get a bag of 50 for about $10 Canadian. And then these are great ways we can do a couple of different things with Play-Doh. So if I am a somebody who likes to listen, so when Adrian gets on deck later, he'll be presenting, I'm a listener. I can just pop out some Play-Doh and fidget with it, right? It's the original fidget spinner, basically. And you can do fun things. You can just let them have the Play-Doh to play with, 
or I've even done different activities, sorry about the guys blowing the snow outside. Um, the other thing I'll do with these is I'll hand out a couple of different colors and you actually will get students sharing and discussing with each other because they want to trade for different colors. So that's another way to get people talking. Sometimes I will do different competitions on the next break. Okay, so at the next break, I want to see who can do the best representation, like self-portrait. Good morning, Leah. Good morning, Marcy. Right, so Play-Doh is a great option, super inexpensive. You can also make it yourself. But the nice thing with these little containers is if somebody leaves the cap off or if they're dirty, it's easy to throw this out. This costs maybe a quarter, 25 cents. It's really not expensive if you have to throw it out. So something to consider. I love using Play-Doh in my classes. It's really underutilized resource. And I've had the, you know, 50, 60 year old men in my pool operator class, really cranky, don't wanna be there. Guys actually light up, like they don't wanna um, admit that they like, Play-Doh, but inevitably smokers or the people who do it with their phone, they Play-Doh. So Leah in High River is saying she stole this idea from me. It's not my idea, Leah. I've seen lots of leadership instructors use Play-Doh. So uh, nice of you to give me credit, but definitely this is the oldest trick in the book. The biggest thing I wanna let you guys know is when we're starting to think about our programming later this year, whether that be July, whether that be September, we are all aquatics people. We will go back to teaching. So if we have a small budget or if we have a little bit of money right now to spend, let's say, $10 on an item like this, certainly there is strains on our shipping systems right now ordering supplies because of essential things being shipped by mail and delivered. But this is something I would really encourage you guys to consider ordering. Good morning, Cheryl Ann. We've got three ladies here from High River. Another thing I wanted to show you a teaching supply that I love is ping pong balls. So this is literally cheap ping pong balls. You can get about, uh, I think I, I have a link for 60 or 70 on Amazon for $12. And these are amazing for a couple of different reasons. Good morning, Stephanie from Sackville, New Brunswick. With the ping pong balls, we can do a couple of different activities. So they can be both in the pool, they can be both on dry land. So on dry land, if I've got some rambunctious teenagers, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds, this is, but obviously you have to use some safety parameters. You can do a hungry, hungry hippo type activity. So you can throw all these balls on the ground in an open space and you can um, do a hungry, hungry hippo activity. So you can have people partnered up. Maybe somebody's doing a handstand, somebody's grabbing their legs, lots of different options. Then in the pool, you can also do a hungry, hungry hippo type activity, collect the balls. Or I really enjoy these ping pong balls for teaching parent and taught or preschool swimming lessons. So how many of you guys are teaching preschool swimming lessons where you have really, really small hands with little small children and they cannot grab the larger balls that we use uh, for swimming lessons? Ping pong balls are a really nice option because the kids can have something that they can hold on to during a lesson if they're nervous. You can do a similar activity where you pour all of the balls in the shallow end and kids are either walking around to practice their water movements safely, you know, walking, hopping, running, skipping in the water to pick up the ping pong balls. You can even do this on dry land. Lots of different options where they can each have their own ping pong ball. I recommend purchasing one color, not multiple colors. We've Most of us have probably experienced where kids get really picky. I want the pink one, he wants the blue one. Grab the white ones. Yes, so Annabelle is asking about choking. So I will bring it closer. I think you could have a three-year-old could shove this in their mouth. So this would obviously be supervised. This would be an activity in Parent and Taught. I'm parented swimming lessons, I'm pouring out the balls, I'm collecting any extra balls, and then I'm letting the parents, if they have, let's say a nine month old that's gripping onto one of these, they are supervising their child. So yes, adequate concern. Uh, Cheryl Ann is saying she's had her preschoolers blow bubbles to move them through the water, right? So these are really, really light, right? I can blow on them. So that's another inexpensive 
awesome idea. And I think to go off of Cheryl Ann's point, you could do this in the bathtub right now under supervision. You could do this in a bucket of water, a bowl of water on the counter. You could also use it with dish soap, right? So dish soap will bubble up a little bit with some water. So these are just some other ideas for equipment. So far I've mentioned uh, things that I always have in my tickle trunk uh, in terms of Play-Doh right play-doh these are the small sizes that they call them the mini or the party sizes for loot bags the other thing i just mentioned was um ping pong balls and i'll show you another thing a couple of you i'm seeing more and more people coming into the room so if you're just joining us welcome let us know where you're from in the chat box that's always nice for the presenters to see locations where are you from in north america your city your state your province uh, Carrie Ann's also mentioning straws and rubber duckies are awesome. I love either curly straws or kazoos, right? Any sort of um, air games you can use. We've got Christine here from Las Vegas. Uh, Alex is here from Austin. Evan's back from Arlington. Welcome everyone. Pop your name in the chat box. The other thing I wanted to mention, and then I will pop the show notes link in the chat box. This is called the meta game. So lots of different card games on the market in 2020. Obviously, there's a gazillion different options. This is one that was made available to me at a leadership course, the Psychological First Aid Instructor course, actually, a couple years ago. This one, sorry, Canadians, I had to order this online from Amazon.com and pick it up from some family. This game comes with um, basically there's this, ooh, sorry says there's seven different ways to play with a, 200 culture cards and 100 opinion cards. So please, um, we the thing I love about this one that, who was it? Erin Wilson from Estevan, Saskatchewan. So she showed me this game. One that I particularly love is um, they have one that is about objects. So the way this game works, right now I'm showing you the Enron card. Another one they've got is, for example, the space shuttle card. And the way this game works, the way Aaron led it as a leadership class, was you would give out these different cards. So maybe I have Enron. Maybe somebody else has space shuttle. Maybe somebody else has NASCAR or Lego. And there's hundreds of cards. And the icebreaker she did with these cards, which was really, really interesting, was I can say what my card is. Or no, how did she do it? So you're basically trying to line everybody up in your classroom group in, in sequential order. So the Olympic Games were founded in 1896, according to this card. Obviously, they're excluding the old Greek Olympics. And then Lego was invented on this card in 1958. And so let's say I had the Olympic Games, and Adrian, who's today's presenter, if he had Lego, we have to describe um what our object is but without giving the year that it was invented and then try as a team to line ourselves up in sequential order. um some variations you could do on that maybe i would disclose that at olympic games and maybe adrian we would discover that he has an interest in sports and he would say okay well i know the olympic games was founded before legos and so this is one of several games that are included in the meta game i believe this was 20 dollars when i ordered it and then they have some other variants. So those of you, obviously this is uh, a PC class, so we're not talking cards against humanity, but similar, they have some discussion cards, right? So you can buy this item for X amount. This could be a good group activity. Um, you can find this under the dictionary definition for, right? So they have some seven different facilitated games. So that's another one that I like. Uh, welcome, Corey from Tabor, Alberta. Terrence is here. Terrence, where, Terrence, are you from Terrence or where are you from? Sue is here from St. Augustine. Love St. Augustine, Florida. I actually have been to St. Augustine twice now and many people don't realize that St. Augustine, Florida is actually the oldest place in the United States that was first um, landed by the Spaniards in the 1400s, I believe. So St. Augustine, Florida is actually older than the 13 colonies in terms of presence in North America by colonists. If you ever have the chance to go to St. Augustine, downtown St. Augustine has these beautiful old buildings built with this reddish 
um, stone. It looks very much like old Spain, like Alhambra. St. Augustine is beautiful. There's the coastline, there's the old fortifications on the water. The downtown is beautiful. It's very walkable. There's these little laneways with these, these, these sort of buildings that come in on the laneway with these little bars and restaurants and shop. It's beautiful. Yeah, so that's my plug for St. Augustine, Florida, when all of this ends. Just up the coastline, so not as well known perhaps as Orlando or um, Fort Lauderdale or Miami, but St. Augustine is beautiful. And actually near St. Augustine, if you're really into pools, as I am, they have one of the Blue Lagoon developments. So Blue Lagoons are um, like Costa del Mar in Chile, these large lagoon developments where they're putting in let's say a thousand acre man-made lagoon for boating and swimming and kayaking. And so they have one just outside of St. Augustine about 20, mi 20 miles away. Um, Bridge of Lions, I think I can picture the Bridge of Lions towards the lighthouse, right? There's the lighthouse and then the, the inlet maybe. So we've got Indiana here. No, so there was a question. <clears throat> Hi, Cindy. You didn't miss the beginning of the webinar. Welcome. What we do before each session is I kind of just do a little bit of a chat. Adrian will be starting in about 10 minutes, a few minutes after the hour. So I'm just here to chat about the last couple webinars we've done. I was sharing some different teaching supplies that I like for swimming pools and aquatics. And just if you're new here, let us know where you're from. So we've got Allison from Bartlett, Illinois. Cindy is here from Sanford, North Carolina, Whiting, Indiana. Um, Susan is from Augustine. We've got Texas. And we were just talking about St. Augustine, Florida. So I'm going to pop in the chat box first couple links for today. Uh, the, and of course, the snowblowers are over here just now. So apologies, you guys. It's going to be an interesting pre show that way. The gentlemen are here to blow off the snow that we had. So I'm located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And literally, yes, it is April. And I woke up this morning. I put this on Instagram stories, like you consultants. It was pouring snow this morning. Basically, beautiful, fluffy white, why April snow. Very common. Hold on a second. Clearly, this is not. <laughs> Jody's back from uh, Cindy's from Miramichi. I hope you caught that. Miramichi, New Brunswick. Um, Natalie's here from Pender Harbor, Duluth, Minnesota. So first link I'm going to pop in the chat this morning, and I will pin it so you guys can see it. There was a request last week. Sorry. Uh, there was a request last week for a self-serve directory for those of you that would like to network as a result of this webinar. So what I have popped in the chat box is a Google Drive document. It is not FOI for FIFA compliance, so please be aware that your information is available to other webinar participants. But if you are looking to network with some of the names that you see in the chat box, please go into that Google Drive. <clears throat> And make sure that you notice at the bottom of the page, there are different tabs for each region. So I've split Canada into four regions. I've split the United States into nine or 10 regions. So please find your region and then pop your contact information in there if you would like to. There is absolutely no requirement to do that. Uh, Kristen here is here from Saskatoon. Terrence has let us know that he's from Compton, California. Melissa's from Montrose, Colorado. Oh, Michael, here we go. Wawas Wawatosa, Wisconsin, 60 and sunny. Definitely not sunny here, or it's all snowing this morning. Uh, I'm also going to pop in the link, our show notes for today, give you guys a chance to open that up as well in your chat box, as well as the show notes for uh, Friday. So those of you who were here on Friday, I am so, so sorry. I have no idea what happened. If you weren't here on Friday, you missed what was a hilarious comedy of errors. So Wayne Ivasich was here from Taylor Technologies and we practiced our session. We did all of the IT ahead of time and still on Friday, the internet gods were not with us. And so he got bumped off. I got bumped off. The room got closed on us. Then the room got locked on us, which I never lock the room. So you can always, any of you know, 
anytime you come to the session, it is always open to join, whether it's five minutes into the session or five minutes into the end of the session. The room is never locked. That's not how I run these free webinars. So the room bumped us out, then the room got locked, then people couldn't get back in. People were understandably upset and frustrated and trying to text me and I couldn't get back to everyone right away. So let me go ahead and add in the show notes for Friday's session. There are two webinar recordings. So at any point, if you got bumped out or you missed what we discussed, there was no party without you. It was quite painful. No, Julie, it wasn't just your internet. It was everything died, right? So click meeting. I got on my phone a split second before this happened. Thank you for hosting your webinar, which is never what you want to see, right? So I had a split second to go, oh no, then the screen died. I was able to get back in, but there were some tech issues and not everyone was able to get back in. So yes, Katie's also saying the links are on YouTube. Thank you. Yes, all of these video recordings are on our YouTube channel, Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. The show notes also include the embedded links. So I typically try and get those up a day or two after the show. Uh, I'm not the, the most tech savvy when it comes to video editing, but I do try and cut out any long gaps or any we had some echoes on Friday that I left for about 60 seconds just because I, I thought that some people might have been able to hear the information in the chat box. So thanks, those of you who are joining us. Hello, Joey is here from uh, Toronto. So Joey Rusnak will be speaking next Monday, April 13th. I will pop that into the chat box. Joey will be talking about um, motivating your team, your aquatic staff team and engaging with them. Let me pop that link in the chat box if you'd like to hear Joey speak. The registration is still open for that link. There's lots of space. We do have, sorry, I'm looking through my links here. I don't have all my links ready like I thought I did. Joey will be speaking next week. One moment. Uh, Joey, if you're not familiar, Joey is from Lifeguard Authority. Oh, sorry, you guys, one second. Every day is a new day. All right, here's the link for Joey's session. Pop that in the chat box. So Joey's here. Uh, welcome, Shelly from Sparwood, BC. Hi, Kim. Hello, Kim from Hawkesbury. Kim joined us two weeks ago as a panelist. Welcome, Kim. Temiskaming Shores, we've got Slow, Northern Ontario, Austin, Aiden's back from Ottawa U, hello, Creston, BC, welcome everyone. So you're not late, you're a little bit early, we're going to be starting in a few minutes after the hour, I will introduce Adrian. I am going to now pin the show notes so everyone can see the show notes for today. I will pin those at the top of the chat box so you can see what to expect in terms of show notes for today. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, we've got a few minutes to go still. Oh, I see some other names. Tanya's here from Okotoks. Ashley here. Hello. Also worth mentioning. So Ashley Munoz is here from Farmer's Branch. We have another person from Farmer's Branch this Wednesday. Yes, this Wednesday, April 8th. We have Paul Macias talking from Farmer's Branch Aquatic Center. So Ashley, can you pop your Instagram account? Farmers Branch Aquatic Center, FBH2O, as well as they have a really cool website, FBH2O.com. And so he will be talking engaging uh, aquatics on Instagram. So I will pop the link as well in the chat box for that session. Lots of registration space still. All of these webinars, we can accept up to a thousand people. We're not even close to filling these sessions. So don't worry about that. I've popped Paul's. A registration link in the chat box and Ashley I'll get you to pop in your Instagram please for Farmers Branch. Ben is here from Toronto. Tyler so glad you made it in from Springfield Missouri. Anna Cortez, Anna Cortez, Anna Cortez from Washington. Iowa City, Rapid City, South Dakota, Hamiota, Manitoba, Port Orchard, Washington, Boston, Massachusetts, Plano, Castlegar, um, Creston, Golden, Colorado, Coors Beer, Sunshine Coast, Baylor University, Waco, Texas. Lots of people recognizing each other in the chat box, so say hello. 
Sacramento, California, Hartford, Connecticut, Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're just joining us, we're ticking up there in numbers. Let me know where you're from. It's nice for our presenter, Adrian Spencer, as well, to know where you're from, your city, your state. This is your first webinar. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hope we don't scare you off. San Diego, Belmont, Michigan, St. Cloud, Minnesota, Farmington, Maine. I think we're hitting all the states. Uh, University of Maryland at Baltimore, Austin, Texas, San Diego, California, Peoria, Arizona. Yes, Paul will be speaking on Wednesday. Lacombe, hello, Kim. Good to see you. Portland, Oregon, Boulder, Colorado, Prince George County, Maryland, Blair, Wisconsin, Vineland, New Jersey, Allentown, Pennsylvania. AJ's here as well. Hello, Adrian is also here. He's getting organized. We can see Adrian a little bit. Uh, Vineland, Sarah, Sedona, Arizona. Oh, Sedona is also beautiful. Sorry, I'm going to do a plug as well for Sedona. If you ever have the chance to go to Sedona, the thing I never knew about Arizona coming as a Canadian before I lived near El Paso for a couple years. So Sedona is this beautiful pine forest in Arizona. And Adrian, I'll have you mute your mic temporarily. Um, Sedona just has beautiful trees and forest deep in the state of Arizona. And you wouldn't even believe they get snow there. There's cool winds. It's like nothing you would expect for Arizona. They have Cathedral Rock there. Just if you can never go to Ser Sedona, go to Sedona. Kim says, yes, love Flagstaff. So that's my plug for Arizona. Um, last couple things I'll mention before I introduce Adrian. So the show notes for, nope. I definitely put the wrong show notes in the chat box. Why did nobody tell me that? Or that was the show notes for Monday. For Friday, let me put the show notes for today. That would be of benefit to everybody. <laughs> uh, we've got SUNY, New SUNY Delhi. Shauna's here from Edmonton. Hello, Shauna. Thank you so much for that email last week. Made my day. So I've pinned the show notes for today. Those are now in your chat box. So you can go ahead and open up that link that will have a lot of the things um, that not necessarily Adrian is specifically discussing, but there's some really great YouTube links in there. We've also got some different resources. Those of you that are new to these webinars, this is the staged show notes. So then after we do this webinar, I will go back in, I'll listen to the audio, I'll look at the chat box, I'll pull all the links out and further flesh out those webinar notes. So Sean is lots of people here. So thanks for joining us, you guys. I think I'm gonna start my brief introduction, then I'll start the introduction for Adrian. We're just a couple minutes after the hour, 11 a.m. here in Mountain Standard Time, so welcome. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We've got nearly 200 people here, so really, really great attendance. I was pushing yesterday on Instagram really to get people thinking about accessibility. It's kind of a thorny topic. People are uncomfortable about accessibility. People are not always willing to admit that they are not comfortable with dealing with accessibility or making sure their facility is accessible. So I think today is going to be an interesting session. I'm gonna introduce myself first and then I will introduce Adrian. So my name is Katie Crysdale and I'm from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. We're located near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And the reason I started these webinars is I wanted to provide an opportunity for aquatics professionals anywhere, right? And I think you can see from the chat box that we've got people from all across Canada, all across the United States. Our first week, we also had Cuba and South Korea. So we'd love to be international. If you're international, let us know. But the idea behind these free webinars is just letting you know that you're not alone, that we're all experiencing this to some degree together, and that this information is available for you to continue to grow in your role as an aquatic professional, regardless of the COVID pandemic, okay? So welcome to those of you that are just joining us, the show notes and chat box. I'm gonna introduce Adrian Spencer, and then I will uh, pass it over to him so that we can get started and respect your time. Uh, if you're having any tech issues, I should put the phone numbers in the chat box first, just to make sure. So if you're having any audio issues, Chrome is always the best option. Internet Explorer is not so great. You can also call in. Hello, Hartford, and hello, Northern Virginia. Hello, Willa. So this is a call-in number for the United States. I will put in the participant PIN number. If ever at any point you have an issue, you can access this way. 
as well as Alberta, Canada. I'm going to give you guys a Calgary access number. Same thing, use the presenter, the participant pin. Hello, Renee from Calgary. So I'm going to introduce Adrian, but before I do that, I should also let you know once Adrian is presenting, myself and Ryan Jones will be in the chat box. So Ryan is a colleague of Adrian. So we will do our best in the chat box while Adrian is presenting to answer any questions, resources that you have um, or need. We will try and pop those in the chat box. The typical format that we follow is the presenter will present. So today it's Adrian, he will present. At the end, I will make some short announcements and then we will go into Q&A. The Q&A will take as long as it takes. If, if you can join us, great. If you can't, everything will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube within a day or two. So I'd like to introduce a great friend of mine today, Adrian Spencer. He's located near Halifax, Nova Scotia. So those of you Americans unfamiliar with Canadian geography, he's at the opposite end of Canada right now, to the east, northeast of Maine. Adrian grew up thinking his swimming instructors were the coolest people on the beach. This exposure led to a career in aquatics, beginning as a lifeguard and instructor and culminating with managing a busy facility. The closure of his facility gave him the opportunity to pursue a par parallel passion in engineering. He graduated from a mechanical engineering technologist program and went on to specialize in fluid systems. Parallel interests all converged when he entered technical sales. Through working as a professional Canadian ski patroller, Adrian met a very influential friend with a traumatic brain injury. Witnessing her overcome so much ultimately led him to be instrumental in bringing a world-class facility to a uh, blah, 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 the Canadian pools. In his spare time, he explores the Atlantic coast on his wave runner, trains kids in life-saving sport, and he's the lifeguard who lifeguards the lifeguards. Okay, so I'd like to give a warm welcome to Adrian Spencer. Hey, everybody. Uh, hopefully that audio works good there. Thanks, Katie, for the intro. Um, yeah, as Katie mentioned, I've uh, been doing a lot of this stuff over time and have had some friends uh, that I've made in that time through all my connections that have been influential for me for realizing uh, how much people are pushing their boundaries um, and as well how much the water can benefit people. As most of us know from running aquatic facilities, um, the people that come in and use our facilities, a lot of times we get to see um, major changes in their health and stuff just from simple things like visiting an aqua size class once a week. Um, so with that, I, uh, you know, the gears started turning in my head, wanting to see more people use it and seeing budgets not get it appropriately uh, appropriated for pools and stuff started to make it kind of difficult for me to, to stomach how we weren't like helping out the community. Um, through my roles with technical sales, I got involved and with all of that nagging in the back of my head, when I come across a fantastic pool lift, um, I had pushed my previous employer to bring that to Canada. And since then, it's done quite well. Um, it's very well received in the, uh, the rest of Canada and I've become very vocal. Uh, sometimes it comes across as being a little bit hard on people or a little bit of uh, a little bit crass or a little bit too um, coarse. Um, but my goal, as with everything else I've done in my life, all my teaching and everything, no matter how hard I am on people and stuff, it's all to see the envelope pushed. It's to see facilities get better. It's to see us do better as, as individuals and to see us do better as uh, service providers um, and just to constantly improve. Um, so with that, I think Katie's got a bit of a, got my questions loaded up here. Yeah. Uh, so one thing I like to do with people when I give these talks is to start to get people to think about how they speak about people with disabilities. Um, and myself, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. I am nowhere near perfect. I try really hard to use um, appropriate language uh, and try not to be condescending, but also try to like really make sure that people are feeling good about how they navigate the world. So with that, if you guys can all take a couple minutes here, the quiz is anonymous. Um, it's just to get you thinking about how you interact with people and how you think about people um, and to kind of unsettle you here in a minute and make you kind of sit back and go, oh, wow. 
Um, so yeah, if everybody can go and uh, vote on those things there, I know it seems pretty trivial, but uh, it's pretty, um, it'll tie in well with what I'm saying here and it'll all start to make sense. Um, generally the language that we use around people, like Katie was saying, a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable. We generally, most people navigate the world, whether it's their work or their personal life, um, with not really having much interaction with people who aren't immediate family, who have uh, disabilities, diseases, life-changing injuries. Um, so they're not totally comfortable with what's acceptable, with what they can say, um, what you can do, uh, you know, what things might set them off, might make them uncomfortable, how much struggle they have in their daily life. Um, so we uh, we want to try and change how people think about that and try to make people more comfortable. And uh, I apologize for the grammar police there. Sorry for that. Uh, sometimes I miss things. My bad. Um, yeah, so if everybody can go vote, we'll uh, bring those results up in a couple minutes here and uh, see what everyone thinks um, and see what our preconceived notions of uh, people that navigate through the built environment are, um, and it'll help us. So Katie's giving us a bit of a countdown there. She's going to tabulate results. Like we said, they're anonymous, um, but it's just going to pop up and we'll show you guys a little bit of the results. Uh, to see what uh, what people are uh, showcasing here. Um, so people are pretty much split on riding a bike. Both are technically correct, except for where I messed up the grammar. Um, so yeah, you're on a bike or you ride a bike. Uh, a person is in a car or drives a car. Both make sense and both don't really change the connotation about how we think about people. Um, but the one that I'd like to point out is the last one um, and I use this one as a great example because it showcases how we think about people um, the connotation that someone is in a wheelchair often makes it sound more restrictive and it makes it sound like they're very limited um, I typically try to use the phrasing people ride a wheelchair I ride a bike I drive a car I would if I end up injured from all my crazy activities and I'm using a wheelchair, I'll be riding a wheelchair. I won't be in it. Um, and that different little bit, um, that little bit of different mindset changes how you perceive how people are navigating the built environment. It changes how you think that they're going about life and what they're going on um, and what they're, what they're experiencing, what they're choosing to thrive doing. Um, it's, it may seem like a fairly small difference, um, but that connotation in our head really changes how we think about people. Um, so it, it's a little activity I like. It kind of turns the lights on for people to be like, oh, yeah, that's kind of neat. Like, you know, yeah, you're right. Like people ride a wheelchair. And some of the clips that I might get to show you later from some of the inspirations I follow from, you know, adaptive athletes and, all, and stuff on Instagram and the Internet and things really go to show that those guys definitely aren't in a wheelchair. They definitely ride a wheelchair. Um, so anyways, uh, thanks for filling out the quiz there. Thanks for your feedback on that. Hopefully it helps everybody out a little bit with, um, your, uh, mindset. Um, but moving on, I'm going to do a little pre PowerPoint presentation with you guys, uh, just to have some visuals here. So you're not just staring at me in my half built house and, uh, the, uh, blank background. I uh, just got to get the screen sharing icon. Okay, can everybody see the PowerPoint uh, pop up there? I'm running two screens, so for me, I get to see my screen, but I'm just making sure the technology worked that the second screen is sharing for you guys. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I also like to be kind of try to be funny, try to be very cut and dry, like to the point. Um, so I apologize in advance. I don't mean to be offensive. Uh, I just try to unsettle people a little bit and make them challenge how they're thinking about things and try to bring a little bit of humor to it. Um, so uh, hopefully I'm okay and I'll watch it. I don't overstep. Um, but 
for me, why this matters to me, uh, Katie alluded to it with a good friend of mine. Um, but it also matters to me because I do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, I have a grocery list of injuries that I've accumulated so far in my life. And frankly, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be me that needs the access to the pool. And I hope that by the time I have to use that, it's better than what it is. Um, so some of this is slightly selfish for me because I know one day I'm going to be there. Um, I live what most people would consider a pretty risk, uh, uh, pretty risky life. I do a lot of extreme sports and uh, have a fairly low regard for my personal safety for some stuff. Um, so eventually I'm going to be banged up and I have been banged up and I've had to go through things. Um, you know, uh, earlier in the fall, I was building my house here. I was doing the insulation in the attic. My hands were so sore after two and a half days of throwing uh, 200 plus bales of insulation that when I went to go to the airport to go for a flight to go visit my girlfriend, I got stopped in security and was made to open up my iPad. And I'm a pretty big guy. I don't walk around like I have pain. I have no visible signs. I could not get the cover off my iPad. And I had to argue with a retired person who was working uh, at the security thing, who's just trying to enforce the rules. It's not her, her prerogative that they needed to provide something for me to pop my case open because they would not let me through security without me taking the case off. And that, uh, you know, without doing that, they were denying me my flight, but they wouldn't give me anything to open it because of course, I can't carry a knife with me, so I can't take out a Swiss Army tool and pop my case off my iPad. So here I was, somebody who's, you know, generally doesn't have any issues navigating the built environment, and now all of a sudden I can't get on a plane because my hands are too sore from two and a half days of labor that I can't get my iPad case off. So this stuff applies to everybody. It's not just um, people who in the past we've traditionally thought about as being disabled or handicapped or whatever other terms we used to use. This is everybody. Our lives are changing. We're living more sedentary lives and we need to figure out how to make things better. And a lot of these changes that make things better, they really don't impact anything. They just make life better. Um, so um, we'll move on to the next slide. Sorry, brain fart on the moment of where I was there. Um, so part of this is also coming about because in North America, uh, the U.S., you guys have the ADA. Uh, North America, in uh, Canada, we're seeing legislation start to come in. We haven't had it as sweeping and as fast as the U.S., um, but they're requiring businesses and governments to uh, become more serviceable for the public. People need to have that accessibility. Um, and where I come from with this is from watching my friend Kalika. Uh, and the things that I see and that are being done in pools and stuff now, where accommodating pool, accommodating people with disabilities is the minimum. It is not what we should be shooting for. It is we, what we should be shooting for is seeking those people out as customers. So uh, a couple stats, and I apologize to everybody that's on here for from the states. Um, these are stats that I just have pulled for previous presentations that we use. They're for Canada but I'm pretty sure they're very similar numbers across the board. Um, so currently in Canada, we're at one in seven Canadians have a disability that affect their daily life. Um, they're expecting that by 2036, that'll climb to one in five. So that means out of the uh, approximately 250 or so people who have logged on for this, um, you're looking at 20% of that are possibly people that have gone through stuff that impacts their daily life. Um, which is a big number just out of the people that are sitting here watching this. Now, if you have a community that has 100,000 people, that's 20,000 people in your community that need, um, that, that have something that impacts their daily life. Um, this stat is directly from uh, parents with children who have special needs. 78% uh, of them say that their children do not participate in community programs. One of the biggest reasons that they cited for that was lack of knowing what was out there. Um, and the way that they were mostly finding out about that is by word of mouth. 
Um, as somebody who ran a pool before and now has been out of it, has changed over to other first aid realms, uh, going from aquatics to ski patrol, coming back, I can say, unfortunately, aquatics and even ski patrol when I'm over there too, we're some of the worst offenders. We forget that we're in our own little bubble. People don't know what we know. Um, so for a lot of people, they have no idea about the pool in their community. They don't know what it looks like. They don't know what uh, options are available. They don't know what the schedule is. And having sat on both sides of the table now as somebody who ran the pool and now as somebody who tries to call on pools as a customer or as a trying to call on them doing sales to, to bring them on as a customer, I realize how hard it is for people in the community because I went from the person who was designing the website and putting out the content where I was like just throwing up a couple pictures thinking, oh yeah, everybody knows about my pool. Everybody knows where this is. Everybody knows what it is. And so you just, I never really realized that people didn't understand the layout of the building. And when I got into doing sales and I started trying to do homework on my customers when, before I go for a visit with them, I would try to look up the pool. I couldn't find pictures. I couldn't find details. And, you know, for people that are in the community that are trying to, to use these services, if they can't find these details, they're not going to search you out. Um, so, you know, it can be as simple as the mom with two toddlers that wants something to do on an afternoon. Well, if your facility is too hard to find pictures and stuff to figure out if it's a good place to go, she's going to take them to the movies or the playhouse because she knows the kids aren't going to be disappointed and turned away. If it's an individual that rides a wheelchair and they can't see, you know, how many steps there are in places, if you guys have a ramp, what it looks like getting out of the parking lot, they're not going to come seek out your business. Um, but if you turn around and put all that on the internet, you set yourself apart from other places. Most times when I'm searching out clients and I'm looking up their facilities, the best resource for the, the pictures and to figure out what the pool looks like, in almost all cases, that I've ran into in Canada and a couple that I've looked up in the States have been uh, from Google. Just the one that pops up when you get the Google business page, like the, the directions and the uh, phone number and everything. And those pictures are from patrons in the community. They're not even from the facility itself. Um, so if people can't see that stuff, how are they gonna know what you have? So from an accessibility perspective, what I often tell customers and stuff when I'm talking with them is that, you know, show people what you have, show them you want them as a customer, go through and take pictures of all the things, even if it seems trivial, go take a picture of what it looks like at the parking spots out front, go take a picture of the front doors, um, take pictures of the hallway, take pictures of the change rooms, brag about every little thing you have and be honest about those. The worst thing that people run into, and it doesn't matter who, any business that we visit, and if they're not honest, it frustrates us because we show up with a preconceived notion and now we're in an embarrassment situation. So now we're upset. So for individuals who struggle through their daily life all the time trying to find this information and they show up to your facility and they get turned away or they get discouraged because something doesn't quite work for them because it's not what was advertised or you advertise the at a pool lift but there's no place for the person to change those are going to create embarrassing moments and embarrassing moments turn to customers that get turned away and they turn to customers that are going to be very uncomfortable and complain and argue and be very difficult with you. If you're honest with them up front about it and show how you're continually trying to improve, those customers still aren't gonna to be totally happy that you fully haven't accommodated them, but at least you're showing that you're trying and you're getting there. Start with that. Take those pictures, get them up, advertise all that stuff you've got and show people you want their business. So, the reason that I preach to show people you want their business is because in today's world, uh, with medical and technological advancements that we have, um, people are living a fuller lives. Um, they're living through things that previously they didn't. And there's a lot of people that are now no longer accepting the fact that they're just relegated to being in their house and being miserable. They wanna go out and have meals. 
They want to go out and seek out recreation services. They want to go visit and do their own taxes with the municipality. They want to do their own banking. So with these changes in, in medical advancements and technology, people are becoming more and more uh, able to move around the environment that we're in. Whereas years ago, they may not have survived uh, diagnosis of certain things. Uh, the technology may not have been there for them to be able to try and navigate the built environment or even simple things just were not in place to let them try and do things. But now they're starting to realize that they can go out and do more and they can push and do new things. Um, uh, you know, for example, our military. Um, you know, in previous conflicts 20, 30 years ago, individuals that got injured on the front lines often didn't make it to high level care. Well, now with the planes that are available, the triage hospitals and the, the network we have, we're seeing individuals survive things that would not have happened before. And to, the reason I use the military for a great example of this is because these are individuals who previously lived extremely independent lives and extremely active lives. These are not the people that are gonna relegate themselves to sitting at home. They are going to push hard and we see stories of it all the time. And these guys are also turning in inspirations because their stories make the news, because they're pushing the envelope so much. So people that are at home, they start to realize like, you know what, I could do that too. I'm gonna go out, I wanna do something. I wanna take up swimming. I wanna take up surfing. I wanna take up skiing they're gonna go search out those things. And that equipment is starting to quickly adapt and be there for them to be able to do that. We're also starting to realize with that, that the water is a fantastic place to be. And people are searching out those exercise opportunities to make themselves better, make themselves stronger, and to rehab better, whether it's mental rehab of going out and being included in stuff, or it's the physical rehab of doing things, they're getting out and they're doing things. Um, they're they're trying stuff. They're they're getting out of their uh, they're getting out of their house. They're they're building up strength. They're happier. They're living more fulfilled lives. And again, the military we're seeing these. We're also seeing a large number of adaptive athletes starting to make the news. Um, for example, one of the largest adaptive sports movements in North America, some of you may have heard about it, is Nitro Circus. Um, it's these crazy guys that started out on dirt bikes doing backflips and craziness on dirt bikes. One of their top performers that they take around the world with them when they do these crazy live shows is Aaron Fotherington. His nickname is Wheels. And the reason his nickname is Wheels is because he rides a wheelchair. He was born with a... Uh, and the name's not coming to me right now. He was born with a, a condition. Um, so he uses a chair. And he has basically self-invented a whole sport. He ha is one of, known as one of the godfathers of uh, wheelchair. Uh, it's called WMX or WCMX. Basically, he goes and plays with his wheelchair in a skateboard park. Um, you know, so kids are seeing these guys. He's got, an, he's got a, um, a Hot Wheels uh, car, little wheelchair, out with Hot Wheels. He's become that big of a thing. So now you have people that are growing up in a world where you can buy a dinky car of a Corvette or a Camaro, or you can buy the wheelchair. So kids that now, you know, never had any inspiration before are growing up with that inspiration. And it trickles down through everything. There's adaptive snow sports athletes, there's adaptive surfers, there's even guys and girls that are at home um, that are becoming major sensations in the gaming community. People are realizing that through online stuff, they can connect and they can go online, they can play games and they can do things and they can start to build up a world for themselves. Um, and many of these people are finding an income through doing these things by pushing this envelope and finding realms where they can, they can do stuff. Um, so, you know, there's more and more people seeing this and more and more people living it. And then, you know, as kids grow up, as people have life changing injuries, they start to see these inspirations and they refuse to sit at home and not do anything. They want to seek out new things to do. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, 
you know, they're they're choosing to go out and do things. Um, they are um, inventing new things. We're seeing constant new inventions coming out. We're seeing people tinker. One of the greatest videos that I like to share when I have time, uh, it's a guy on YouTube called uh, Jerry Rig Everything. Uh, he took and uh, took basically what looks like the same electric bikes that you can buy at Costco, like the fat tired mountain bikes. He took it and modified it for his, uh, I think girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife. She rides a wheelchair. She has never really been able to go off road very much because of the limits of the chair. And there's a great YouTube video of this guy that has basically invented an at home four wheeled electric dirt bike wheelchair thing for her out of these two bikes that he could buy at Costco. He welded them together, made the throttles work. And the excitement on her face of burning around the parking lot and jumping curbs is amazing. Like she's so happy to see that. So she's, she now, even in the video, she mentions that now she can explore trails and stuff that she previously couldn't even pack dirt trails, you know, around the community. She couldn't go that far on before on them before. And now she has almost unlimited range. So, you know, they're pushing and getting out of the house and doing things and seeking stuff out. Um, you know, we see it in our, in our world in aquatics, there's a, um, Olympic backstroker, backstroker who was born with no arms. He's amazing to watch swim. Katie posted a link there just a minute ago. Um, it's, it's in, it's incredible to watch this guy go through the water and do flip turns and everything and totally outpace anything I could hope to do with four limbs. You know, and the limitations are just in our mind. And the more we get people into the pool and the more that we show them we want them, the more we're going to see this stuff grow. And at the end of the day, most of the things that these guys need really don't change what we're doing with facilities. They're only minor tweaks that really at the beginning of the project just change what the, the, the um, conceptual picture looks like. It doesn't really change the facility itself, other than the fact that now all of a sudden it's inviting. It becomes this very um, open, inviting vibe that everybody likes. Um, you know, when we're building facilities, no matter how you build them, they kind of cost the same. Yes, some of the accessibility equipment will add a cost, but at the end of the day, most of the accessibility equipment, when you factor it into the building and you design things right, there's not a whole lot of cost change to the size of the project. But when you get all those pieces right and you don't just aim for the checklist and you really want to go out and seek those customers out, you start to give off that other vibe for your facility. So people are very happy. They want to seek out your place. They feel comfortable when they come in it. Um, this is a thing known as intellectual accessibility. Most facilities, um, you know, when they're built, they take into account the building code, the architectural, you know, engineering checklist. You know, does it have wheel? How many parking spots does it have? Do we have cutouts in the curb for people to get over? Do we have automatic doors? Do we have toilets with, um, you know, bars beside them? And you go through and you check all the boxes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you made the facility accessible. That means you're accommodating everybody, but it doesn't mean you're seeking out those customers. Um, in my world, mostly what I've dealt with with accessibility sales and stuff is selling pool lifts. Well, I have to check with customers when they come and ask me, like, well, what does your parking lot look like? What does your building look like? Where are the patrons getting changed? Because I can sell you the lift, so you can check the box off, but if none of that stuff is there for the rest of it, the lift is no good to you. Um, Katie had a great one before that uh, it was an accessibility lift and it was like three or four stairs to get up to it, to get into the spa. So yeah, it checked off the box that the spa had an accessibility lift, but how do you get a wheelchair up four ramps to then get lowered into the spa? Like it didn't make any sense. So. When you're building these facilities, keep in mind, and when you're giving input on these and, and new ones are coming up, keep in mind that you want to make sure that you're telling customers you want them. If you're just showing that you're checking off the boxes, that doesn't tell customers you want them. Um, a great example of that, it's 
kind of not entirely right but you know if you drive up to a drive up bank machine they have braille on them yes i understand that from a manufacturing standpoint they only make one kind of quick keypad but that is one of those funny things that's like well why do you have braille on the drive up keypad machine to get my money out of the bank if i need braille i'm not driving a car like it's not possible so but manufacturing wise they've gone to braille for every single pad so in one sense it looks silly but in the other sense they made the change and they just said okay well we'll just make all the keypads with braille there it's done now we don't have an extra cost for a machine that needs braille um but in the other sense it does look silly that you're like at first you're like why do we have braille on the keypad that you drive up to um so many of these small design features can really change how people view a facility um you know it's it's the simplest thing like uh the signage where's your front entrance many of the facilities that are getting built and stuff they're huge um and oftentimes we don't know what is truly the front entrance uh, we don't know where that entrance is in relation to the front desk um or the the administration desk the point of entry that you have to pay at for somebody that has uh some form of ambulatory impairment that mistake of going to the wrong door could result in them going home that day um one of the facilities, the facility that I work at currently uh, in my spare time doing junior lifeguards, they have two entrances. One entrance has a full flight of stairs to get down to them. Um, so when people come to that facility for the first time, depending on which parking lot entrance you go to, you can end up at the complete wrong entrance and have no idea that you now have to go down a giant flight of stairs to get to your um, to get to the front desk to go pay for and do whatever activity you want. And there's no signage outside to say this is the front desk um you know and even once you're in the facility there's no wayfinding signage there's nothing that instantly speaks to you that says hey this way um and for somebody that um you know has an ambulatory impairment those extra few steps they're crucial so for example my good friend kalika she suffered a major traumatic brain injury uh, she was very fortunate and got a very large settlement out of the car accident. So now she's able to live out and do whatever she wants because she has the resources. But when she goes to places, an extra 10 steps is agonizing. It's a full on um, trip to try and do something. She walks as if somebody is, she presents like somebody that's had uh, major stroke symptoms. So walking is very difficult. Um, you know, so ending up at the wrong door and having to walk back out to the vehicle and change the place in the parking lot it's kind of embarrassing it's really disheartening um, and it doesn't speak to the community to say that everybody's welcome um, other things like um, you know like expansive landscaping and you know a lack of parking spots and big fancy concrete work and landscaping out front that's terribly inaccessible to patrons who have mobility issues. Um, you know, if they're trying to come and go for a swim and get in the pool and they have to walk across, you know, 50 yards of, or 50 meters of concrete and pathways and stuff from the, that takes a lot out of them if they're trying to come and go get in the pool. So those things can be big hindrances to people that are coming to your facility. So think about that when you're trying to lay out designs and, and giving input on new stuff, or you know, if you're looking at doing renovations, is how can we make the distance as short as possible to get people in and make it as obvious as possible that this is where you come into the facility. This is the shortest entrance to get you to the front desk so that when you get there, you're ready to go and you can go do your activity and you didn't expend a ton of energy and a ton of embarrassment of going to the wrong place um the uh you know one of my biggest pet peeves that i joke about around here and this is where my crassness comes in uh the facility i'm at uh, that i work out of it's a leeds facility for those that most likely most people kind of know about it it's a engineering standard architectural standard that has has different tiers basically trying to show the environmental impact of the facilities i I love it in some senses, but absolutely despise it in others. The facility I work at is a prime example of what I was just complaining about. It has expansive concrete pathways and stuff out front because 
by lead standard, it's only allowed to have so many parking spots. So their solution to not having extra parking spots was to build this bigger architectural expanse way of concrete and stuff. Um, the downside to that is you have these expansive concrete areas that you now have to navigate and get over or go past or walk those extra steps to get inside when they could have used that whole area to put in like 15 accessible parking spots. It's massive. And on top of that, they built this facility, and I apologize and hope this doesn't offend anybody, but they built it in a redneck town, and they expect people to carpool. Everyone has a truck, if not two trucks in the family, and they come with like one person in a truck to the facility. So every time there's a hockey game, the place is jammed. There's no room to park anywhere. Any, nobody can get around. So even people that don't have accessibility parking, that don't need an accessible parking spot, but still may find walking half a kilometer down the side of the road to get to the hockey game is insurmountable for them to go to that game for that night. So there's no public transport, but hey, the facility meets leads. So in some ways it's fantastic, but in other ways it doesn't accommodate the community um, and can be a major barrier. Like I said, sometimes people aren't coming out to the major sporting events, which are, are big in that community because that's all it's there because they got to park half a kilometer up the road and walk down the shoulder. They, they, they can't do that. Um, it's other things like doing big architectural pillars in the middle of it. Um, it's not, you know, they look great and everything, but what happens when somebody visits your facility that has a visual impairment? Um, oftentimes people with visual impairments will use the sides of corridors to navigate their way around. Well, if they're walking along and now all of a sudden there's a pillar two feet out from the wall, that really hinders their flow through the facility. Um, so it's small things like this that don't impact the cost of the building that have been factored in to make the place look pretty, but really have a negative effect on certain members of the community. Um, you know, large echoey corridors and stuff for individuals on the autism spectrum. You know, many facilities have these big, expansive open areas and they get very echoey, they get very loud, that, that the noise just starts to hum and build itself up. For people with these disorders, that becomes a very major hindrance for them. And, you know, they're not gonna seek them out. One thing I absolutely love is here in Nova Scotia, we had a group of school kids write to one of our major grocery chains, uh, Sobeys, it's one of the major two in Canada, um, and asked them to do a special time at night because one of their classmates, uh, I believe it was one of their classmates, their mom had challenges getting groceries because the grocery store is always so loud. And to take the child that had autism to the grocery store was always a fiasco and whatnot. So these kids wrote a letter as a class to the, to the grocery chain. That grocery chain turned around and made and said, okay, hey, here's a, here's a whole bunch of customers that we're not serving. So let's serve them. They made a, a low, low, um, I can't think of the name right now, low sensory environment for people. They turned the beepers off on the scanners. They turned the lights down a little bit at night. They bring in extra, yeah, sensory friendly. There we go. Thank you. They bring in extra staff uh, to help people navigate the store if they need it. All because they realized that there is a whole market out there that they weren't tapping into. So they looked at people, instead of trying to accommodate people, they went, how can we get more customers in our store? Um, we've seen the same thing happen in Canada with many other things right now with COVID, with the seniors and early hours opening. Those are the same principles. In one light, they're accommodating those patrons, but they're also seeking those customers out. They're showing people that they want them as a major customer. They're not saying, hey, yeah, we did this for you, so come on in and use it. They're saying, listen, we know you guys need this and we want you to come shop at our business, so come shop at our business. You know, Loblaws was one of the first one to do it in Canada. They scored major points with the public for doing that. Now they have an edge. They showed people they want them as customers. So I'm challenging Aquatics to do the same. You guys have those lifts, you have those things. Show people you want them as customers. Don't just check off the box, advertise that you have that lift, advertise that you've got uh, accessible change rooms, that you've got extra wheelchairs, that you've got, um, you know, arthritis friendly aqua size classes, 
advertise all of that stuff because at the end of the day, you're missing out on like 20% of your population. So go show those 20% that you want them as customers. Um, you know, one of the other things that we miss out on as well, uh, we often overlook is windows and pools, uh, windows and multi-service, multi-centers. Um, those can be a uh, those can be a huge hindrance as well. Patrons don't want to come and be in the fishbowl, you know. So these little changes don't really change how we build the facility from a cost perspective, but they make it much more uh, accessible for everybody that wants to come to it. It makes it friendly. It makes people walk in and go, "Hey, I want to be in this space. It's easy to navigate. I'm happy to be here. I don't feel out of place." I don't feel like I'm getting looked at by all the dudes running around in tight t-shirts. Like this is my space. This is my environment too. Um, so I like to use these pictures. These are from facilities in Canada. And uh, just like to point out some of the things um, that are on here that are small things that we don't really think about, but they totally make us um, more friendly to people coming to our pools. Um, one of the things that everybody will notice in here right away that we do in aquatics in almost all of North America is we put the contrasting strips uh, along the edge of the stairs um, and drop offs, all that stuff. That's an accessibility piece that we've been doing for a long time that we don't really realize in an accessibility piece, but it's very important to how people navigate that pool. Um, Another one that we do is all the handrails, right? We have multi tiers. We have them going down all the ramps, all the big long steps, everything to get in the pools. Again, that's another simple accessibility piece that we're including in all these. One that um, gets often overlooked that I like to point out is, uh, and it's one of my pet peeves about pool decks, is the double row of grading. I absolutely despise pool decks that have what I call bird baths on them. Any pool deck that has the little round drains and the deck is 3D contoured everywhere. This is the greatest example of what we were doing from a design perspective that is terrible for accessibility. Uh, when you have that 3D contoured deck, it's terrible for people to navigate. It's terrible for the lifeguards in an emergency situation. It's terrible for the paramedics in an emergency situation. And there's really, no reason to do it because it's terrible for the construction guys to do it too. Um, having worked with concrete and doing concrete work on my own and all that stuff, I, it's a nightmare trying to grade everything in different directions. If you do the double row of grading and put a trench grade on your deck, you can incorporate it as an accessibility piece. Just like the rumble strip, uh, the, the tactile dot strips that you get at like the intersection to cross a, at a crosswalk, um, you can use the grading as that same thing. And now you have a deck that is going to go all in one deck, all in one direction. When you do a uh, round deck drain, you get it caved in all directions. The deck is uneven and, and undulating. When you do a trench grain, you get one long drain the whole way down the side of the pool with a gentle slope both ways. So you still have a slope, but now it's only in two dimensions instead of three dimensions. Um, hey, Dan. And, yeah. Can you address those questions in the chat box? Just briefly restate again, 3D contour decking for our lay people who are not as familiar with concrete, including me. Yeah, no problem. Um, so what I'm referring to is when you get a, um, uh, on the, oh, uh, mostly older we're still seeing it in some new facilities where you get the little round drains that are on the pool deck um and then it's the deck is sloped towards that drain on all 360 degrees of the round drain um as opposed to when you get newer style decks like is in the right hand picture here um, where they use what's called a trench drain so it's a drain that runs the whole length of the side of the pool deck that drain ends up being only one slope now. So you go from the drain all the way back to the wall. Um, is that clearer for people? Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. Um, 
So with the round drains, what ends up happening is you get highs and lows as you walk along that pool deck to make it to the uh, to make it to the next drain and then the next one after that. So that constantly is difficult to travel across. Um, it's difficult in emergency situations. It's difficult for seniors. It's difficult for people with uh, ambulatory assistance like canes and wheelchairs. Um, when, when all we'd have to do is put in a long drain that's actually even easier for the concrete guys to do and make the deck nicer. So it's a little tweak in the design process up front that makes the facility easier to build. It adds possibly an insignificant amount of cost to do a long trench drain over the little drains, but at the end of the day, your facility is much better. And now you can um, explain to your patrons when they come in, if anybody's got an ambulatory impairment, it's the same as the tactile strips on the side of the highway. Hey, when you go to cross the street and you feel that tactile strip, you know to wait there for the crosswalk. Well, when you're going out on the pool deck, you're gonna feel the grating under your feet. It's a couple feet back from the edge of the pool. Know that you're now getting close to the edge of the pool. So that can help people navigate through your pool. Um, one of the other accessibility pieces that's in here, again, like I mentioned, there's no real windows looking in. So people don't feel like they're standing in a different state of undress. Um, we typically don't stand in our living room in our underwear because the neighbors would stare at us. But yet when we go to a pool, we expect that that's socially acceptable and everybody's going to be comfortable with that. Um, so the other things that are missing in this, um, in the picture on the left, you can see up in the corner above where I've got handrails, um, the deck and the pool make the same color. So another simple thing you can do is drastically change the difference between the wall color and the deck color. This helps with people with visual impairments, again, keeping stuff very easy so that they, they can differentiate between the two surfaces. Um, these are all little things that a lot of designers are already incorporating and they really are accessibility pieces. Um, and we already have them in our life, so it's not, it's not a major change, but it makes the place so much better for everybody else that's coming to the facility. Um, I think that's about it. I'm running kind of late on time here and I could keep talking for a long time, but I think I'll move along there to questions. If anybody's got any questions, Katie can jump in and take over there. Um, and I can pop this back to uh, reducing the screen here. Yeah, if you want to mute your mic for just a sec, I will do some announcements and then we'll take some questions that I've noted from the audience. So. Um, thanks, everyone. I know uh, I, even my mind right now is still with what Adrian just said. I mean, I've been on pool decks for 18 years, and I am aware of the drains that he's mentioning, the spaced out drains along the pool deck. But even living with somebody who has uh, difficulty with uneven ground since he had a stroke a few years ago, it never occurred to me, <laughs> again, my able-bodied privilege, maybe that's why he never wants to go to the pool with me, right? Like just the wheels are turning now, the, the, the slopes and then Ryan in the chat box also mentioning the degree to which there would be hundreds of peaks and valleys. Can you guys hear me or is Anne, am I talking and nobody can hear me? <laughs> Okay, okay, perfect, so you guys can hear me. Sorry about that, Anne. There is a call-in number. Um, just the, the peaks and valleys on the pool deck. So let me make a couple announcements. Thank you so much to Adrian. We're gonna circle back to Adrian, so don't leave if you can stay. I do wanna make some quick announcements. The first one I already popped in the chat box, so Swim Angelfish. Um, Swim Angelfish will be here on Monday, April 20th. They are an autism uh, resource center. They focus on swimming lessons. They have seven free webinars on YouTube as well as many paid resources. So Aileen and Cindy will be here talking about making uh, swimming lessons more accessible. They have tried and true strategies that are very practical that you can use both with your autistic students, special needs, as well as with regular students. So I would encourage you to register for Swim Angelfish on Monday, April 20th, if you're interested in more resources in that regard. Also, if you're listening to this and you have local resources, please share those in the chat box. I can add them to the show notes. We've already seen a couple of autism, special needs, accessibility resources. Please dump those in the show notes, uh, in the chat box so I can add them to the show notes. Couple other things I'd like to mention coming up. Um, so we have Fridays, 
uh, April 3rd, the show notes are already live. Those are in the chat box. Please scroll back if you haven't seen them. Wednesday, coming up in two days, we will have another session uh, with Paul Macias talking aquatics on Instagram. I'm gonna pop that in the chat box as well as Farmers Branch Aquatic Center. Adrian, so you know, I'm also looking in my Instagram feed. I knew exactly which post you were referring to with the lift and the stairs, but Instagram is a bit slow this morning. So I'll circle back and add that in when I can get to it. Friday, April 10th, it is Good Friday. If you observe Easter or Passover, um, there will be a recording available, but Tim Auerhan will be with us talking summer startup. And before you laugh, I have talked to Tim about this topic. Summer startup seems a little bit odd right now in the middle of a pandemic. We are gonna be approaching summer startup from the perspective of now is the time that you can revise your summer startup plan, whether you implement it this year or not. So what are the general pieces, not COVID specific, but what are the general pieces that you can address in terms of preseason checklists, recruiting, advertising, communication. So he'll be talking about that. And then so you guys know, I am adding another week to the Pool Aid webinars and coming up in two weeks on Monday, April 27th, we will be having a session of panelists. I'm working with some high volume facilities that recruit 800, 900, 1000 staff, and we're putting together some different um, areas that need to be addressed post COVID for reopening. So that will be coming up. Keep an eye on our website uh, and on Facebook. I'll be announcing that as well. Uh, and then lastly, on Monday, April 13th, we have Joey Resnack from Re Lifeguard Authority. He will be here talking, uh, motivating your team. Thank you for those of you sharing resources in the chat box. Please continue to do that. Um, all of these show notes, uh, let me pin the show notes one more time. Not the backstroke swimmer, although he is inspiring. Let me just pin these show notes for you guys. And then we'll circle back to Adrian for some questions. So if you also have questions for Adrian, please make sure that you pop those in the chat box so he can start to review those. I have a few that I've written down and we will answer all of your questions generally and specifically. So here are the show notes for today. We haven't asked any questions yet, so we will be asking all of your questions. So um let me just start with um oh cheryl's here hello cheryl cheryl from vacova which is a well-known facility in calgary that does uh has a primary mandate to accommodate special needs and other abilities so welcome um first thing i just wanted to briefly mention before i pass it over to adrian uh for questions there was um i loved adrian's point about People need to know what's in your facility. And I want to echo Adrian's point that even when I look up a facility that I get an email from someone from, there's never any photos. And we're all guilty of only having one landing page on one municipal website because the communications department doesn't think the pool needs more than one page and they don't want to manage it for us. Google My Business is your friend. Google My Business is a free listing service on Google. You can claim it during COVID upload your photos, upload your information, add it to your monthly communication update. I've done it for myself, like Lakeview Aquatics business. I've done it for two municipal pools. It takes a little bit of work to set up, but once you get into the habit of updating it, you will find that your clients go there first for the most up-to-date information. And as Adrian mentioned, if you're not updating it, you're not uploading it, there are probably already people in the community tagging photos, uploading photos. If that information is ready to go, you will see additional clients come to your facility. So please, please, please look at Google My Business. Don't ask, don't ask for permission, just do it at your municipality. Guaranteed, nobody will notice. You can set it up with an email. You talk to Google on the phone, they send you an authorization once they confirm that you represent the facility. Start with that. Um, so Adrian, the first question that came up in the chat box, I want you to touch on as best as you can without the aid of obviously visual examples, but people are wondering about signage. How can they address signage for their facilities? I don't really have a great example for that. Um, I don't know. The signage that I'm talking about is more so just specific to the facility itself. Um, more so speaking to wayfinding. I believe the question that they were asking directly um, was in relation to accessibility pieces. Um, I 
I haven't come across any that are really great yet. Um, and I apologize for not having good examples of that. I'm mainly just speaking to the wayfinding. It's when you walk into that new facility and being immediately overwhelmed and uncomfortable that like you don't know where you're going. You don't want to feel like the idiot that's got to ask for instructions. And, you know, so you try and think about how your people are coming in your facility that don't use it every day and just try to have good wayfinding signs so that people know exactly where they need to go as soon as they walk in the door. Well, and yes, that's a good, uh, Shandy just had a really good point, is infographics, make them as plain as possible. Um, very, very yeah. good feedback on that because you, you don't want to have to stand there for five minutes reading the overhead sign. Um, you want to know right away where you're going. So, so there'll be a lag when I jump in because I'm trying to mute myself so that you guys don't get the rebound. Um, but basically, I think, that I love Shandy's point, Adrian. I think, yeah, you might have to mute me. All right, sorry, we're, this is always the awkward part. Um, the pictograms are key, right? So I think I just filled off of Adrian's point. Yes, the feature, the focus of this session is accessibility, but I really want you guys to think too, accessibility can be in the ways that we've discussed, but what about accessibility of language? What about accessibility of literacy? Right. I did an amazing exercise with a facilitator a few years ago and she challenged us to walk into our town hall, our pool. Um, I think it was a grocery store. What would we know where to go, how to do, how to act without prompts? Right. We have maybe new Canadians, new Americans, immigrants, special needs. Right. So I love the idea Shandy says about pictograms. Accessibility is a piece of that. But whether that's physical accessibility, cognitive all of those different aspects. So if you have links to signage at your facilities that you've developed or that you really like, or even Google links, please add those to the chat box or you can email me. I'll pop my email into the chat box as well. And you, we can collect some different resources on the um, show notes. Um, I wanna circle back as well to the dignity piece, Adrian. So what are some basic things that you've seen either not go well from you, know, you being a customer or observing people who are trying to use these facilities or how can we work with our junior staff to get them to understand how they're perhaps treating people who ask you know, questions that we as lifeguards think, well, why don't they know the answer or why do they need this or why, you know, why is this my job? Um, yeah, the, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, one of the points that I forgot to make earlier, uh, and it kind of ties into this, but also ties into the advertising piece. Um, when you're asking about the questions that people are asking, um, we've all had it. We've all been there again. We live in that little bubble sometimes and we forget when we get that question constantly that like the lifeguard snicker about that's like, Oh my God, another person asked that today. That's probably a good piece of information to put on the internet. Um, if people are asking for these things, advertise it. Um, if you're getting a question about that, advertise it. Um, one of the ways that I would suggest if you wanna try and figure out the dignified side and, and get your staff to buy into it, um, and this is kind of where I started snowballing with some of this stuff too when I started really delving into it, was with my junior guards one day, I looked at them and I just pointed them and I said, Lauren, you're riding a wheelchair, you can't use your legs. And Olivia and Tara and Emma, you guys are bringing her to the pool to go swimming today. Go start in the female change room and come on out to the pool deck, go as if you were coming in and we'll have a discussion. And that was, the, that was as much information as I gave these, I think at the time they were like 10 to 13 year old girls. They came back with a list that would make an engineer and an architect sweat at a meeting. Um, they came back out and said, the sink splashes us in the face. There's no change bench in the, in the accessible bathroom. It was too hard pushing Lauren around the benches in the change room. They just had a list and they just kept going. So one of the recommendations I would have is, you know, out of staff in service, put your staff in a wheelchair and tell them to go and start in the parking lot. Okay, come on in. We're gonna go right from parking lot to going for a swim. You guys go through it and see how you feel and see what you had to do. Um, and then they can start to understand the challenges that the patrons are overcoming. And like I said, 
we, some of these facilities already exist, so we, we're, we're a little bit behind and we may not be able to have the proper solution, but at least if we know the challenges that those people are uh, facing when they come in, we can be honest with them about them. And when we give them that honesty, they will be a little bit easier to deal with and be a little more accepting that at least we're aware and at least we're trying because that humanity and that dignity comes back to the equation once the staff know what they're doing and the challenge is it's not the best solution and it really shouldn't be the solution that we're relying on for people but at least it's a starting point for those staff to clue in and be like wow the change room is really difficult to navigate in a wheelchair or wow like i had nowhere to change into my swimming suit and come out on the deck like you know those things so that they can have input on what equipment to buy in the budget next time or they can think of new procedures like oh, okay maybe we should instead of keeping the wheelchair on the pool deck maybe we should have it out at the front desk so that when a patron comes in they can get it right then you know they'll start to figure out those things and you'll get that input yourself to know like how can we adapt our procedures <laughs> So some great comments from Rebecca as well, talking about how can we incorporate this into in-service. So similar to your idea, Adrian, can we do it in in-service? Can we um, can we actually create a situation or scenario in our leadership courses, our lifeguard courses, our um, life-saving classes, and start to get people thinking about different activities? I know certainly um, I, this is an activity I've used for the seek and find when I teach bronze medallion, which is a life-saving program in Canada junior lifesavers we will use old lost and found goggles with electrical tape for the purpose of getting them to develop a search of the pool but i have used those goggles in other circumstances right where they're doing a leading activity right leadership and teamwork how would somebody find their way through the facility um, there's a couple of different things happening in the chat box i want to briefly come to john's question adrian he was asking about drains so let's say you have an older facility with all of those slopes those peaks those valleys to those deck drains is there anything we can do is there any way we can work with that what would you recommend either as like an administrative or staff awareness control piece even if we can't physically change our pool deck um unless you have a retrofit coming up and you can push to try and change those uh there's not much but again it just comes back to being um being forthright with the information um and it does it does take some finessing because there's a difference you need to approach it properly if you want to give patrons the heads up you have to be very delicate about the fine line between trying to be helpful and stereotyping people because some people may be very offended that you assume that they're going to struggle walking on that pool deck um there's i i don't have any great examples of how people have worked with it um it's a pet peeve of mine that i've kind of found and it seems to be a very minor one on the the side of people being aware of it um so i haven't seen a lot of things that people have done to accommodate it um it's sorry, just, I'm, yeah. So I'm smiling. Sorry, this is not your, you guys are probably wondering why I'm smiling. So um, my husband had a stroke a couple years ago. He was in the army for 20 years. So he's going to do it. If he can figure it out, he will. He will hurt himself, burn his hand, whatever he needs to do to get it done because he hates being, he's ashamed that he can't do stuff. Literally, before I hopped on this phone call, and now I can tell you guys because you've got to work. Before I hopped on this phone call, he was getting frustrated with me because I was assuming he couldn't do something that he cannot do because his hand is numb. And he was upset that I would assume that he's incapable. And although I'm trying to be helpful, right, it's just further pissing him off that I'm and I'm telling him that I know he can't do it. So <laughs> we all have a ways to go on that one for sure, right? It's 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 a challenge, right, to help people in a way that is providing them dignity and it's not always helpful right he would rather burn his hand than let me help him at this stage right and we're four years into this right so um it is what it is right that's kind of what happens right yeah so like i said it, it's a fine line between trying to be helpful but also like uh, stereotyping in a bad way um yeah. just just be cognizant of the language you use and try to be as as human about it as possible and doing those exercises like you know having the staff go with a wheelchair or giving them a pair of blacked out goggles things like that to navigate 
starts to make them a little more human for those interactions. Um, and it'll help prepare them for, for when they have to talk to those patrons. Um, shoot, I had another point there that well, your husband, and I can't remember what it is now, totally went as soon as I started talking. That's okay. I, 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 yeah, sorry, mute me. And then um, let me briefly talk on a comment in the, in the chat box and then that might bring back your comment. So Carla is saying it's important to ask the person what if any assistance they want or need. So Adrian, do you have any experience with how you've couched that with clients? Uh, sorry, as a lifeguard or working with aquatic staff, how can lifeguards approach a client? What would be the appropriate way to start that conversation? Or Carla, if you have any suggestions, let's pop those in the chat box. Um, yeah, as lifeguards, uh, we always want to be as helpful as possible because, you know, most of the 16 year old kids are pretty keen on the pool decks. Um, just make sure when you're talking to your staff that, you know, they understand that they, it's not a bad thing to ask for help or to be like, Hey, it looks like you guys are new here. Is there anything I can help you with? If you come at it from that perspective, as opposed to, Hey, I think you have these limitations. Um, you're probably going to get a much different response from the person. And now I remember what my, my point was. One of the thing, one of the experiences that I have had is similar to what you were explaining about your husband and somebody else is responding to both about here that uh, their husband that has MS. Um, some of these individuals, um, they have either lived their whole life fighting this struggle or this has been born upon them in recent memory. The thing that those two individuals have in common is their uncomfortableness with people helping them. Um, and they comes from two different places sometimes, and that can get manifested as a lot of aggravation and a lot of um, confrontationalism. Um, we have seen it sitting in meetings with individuals when we're working on, on uh, disability committees and presenting products and stuff like that. You have to remember that, you know, for example, somebody that's rode a wheelchair their whole life, they, are completely programmed in many cases to fighting tooth and nail for every little thing that they've had to do in their life. They So their immediate reaction sometimes, unfortunately, because of the hurdles that they've had to constantly overcome, they are constantly on confrontational mode <clears throat> right away. So being prepared to wear a little bit of that, to wear a little bit of that crap is, is going to be something that's very challenging for most people. But if you can sit there and take a breather for a second and understand where they're coming from, that for most of the time they get crapped on or they have to, you know, they're sitting in the back row somewhere or, you know, they're always getting the short end of the stick. When you mm -hmm. start to realize that that might be where they're coming from, that might be why they're a little more confrontational right out of the gate. If you take that breather and let it, let it wear itself. I'm not saying take abuse, but I'm saying, you know, sometimes it does take a minute to be the, to just have to be like, okay, you know what, this person goes through a lot more in their daily routine than I do. And I just need to take a breather and let them, let them go and just try and convince them that I'm trying as hard as I can to help them have a little bit better day today at my facility. So just be aware of, you know, maybe where they're coming from. It doesn't excuse somebody for being uh, belligerent, <clears throat> But sometimes understanding why they're belligerent may help you get past it and may help, you know, make everything turn into a positive experience, which sounds very holistic and great, but sometimes it's extremely challenging. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think that's that's often, I mean, let's be honest, in the lifeguard room when the lifeguards are chatting or gossiping about patrons, oh, you know, so-and-so was mad with, with me today. We had a client at my first pool as a lifeguard over 15 years ago, which in hindsight, I'm horrified because she would lose her mind, understandably now with perspective, I understand why, because she would come to the pool and the battery on the lift would would not be charged and we didn't have a spare at that point and it, it was a it was really a charter rights and freedoms issue for us at a municipal facility and we were you know 18 19 year old lifeguards and we just didn't understand that she'd taken paratransit she'd hired her aide to come to the pool she'd hired a second aide because she was a larger individual 
to come to have us set off. We didn't have an, a, a universal change room, so we had to isolate a part of the facility for her to change. And then she would get out to the pool deck. And the only thing that the morning supervisor didn't do was check the battery, right? Like to us, that was it. Like, oh, Susie forgot to check the battery. Whereas to this client, in hindsight, I can understand now where the frustration would come in the financial and the emotional and physical costs of spending 80 minutes getting ready for a swim that they probably were really looking forward to. And then me or my colleague, 19 year old lifeguards, like we just didn't have the battery ready, right? Like, what's the big deal? Why are you being so mean lady? Like that's how we treated it. And I'm sure there's many lifeguards that work for all of us on this call that when we are not around to guide them, they will have the same conversation and lack of perspective that we need to bring them, right? Yeah, and when you scale that up for somebody, you you are only experiencing that one instance where their day went to crap because the accessibility pieces weren't in place for them. Now think about that person grocery shopping, that person going to the pharmacy, that person trying to go out and having a social gathering with people and all of the hurdles that they do and now they come to your facility. So that's where I say like sometimes these individuals, all they have done all their life is fight for some form of semblance of freedom that we have to move through the environment. So they're a little bit, you know, they may be ready to fight right out of the gate every time because it's just what they have to do every day, every time they do something. So um, one of the other questions I would like to ta talk to that I saw pop up a few minutes ago here and I didn't talk about it in mind and it is a big piece that I like to bring up. Um, it's almost off topic from where I was going with this about seeking out customers, but I think it is very relevant, um, is somebody brought up a point there that they don't allow their staff to handle patrons, um, to help with transfers, all of that stuff. And to you, I applaud you. Um, 100%, I fully agree with that. It is one of my biggest pet peeves um, that I see from a staff point of view. Um, I understand, and I was there. I used to do it as a lifeguard, as a manager. I used to be there, right there. Hi, can I help you? I'll help transfer you from your chair to the lift. I have so many problems with that now. One, uh, in many jurisdictions in Canada, just to do wheelchair lifts for somebody and be a continuing care worker is a one-year community college program to be properly trained. How do we expect 16-year-old lifeguards, 20-year-old lifeguards, 45 year old lifeguards to go and make these transfers when they've never been trained. They have no understanding. Um, the, other re the other point to that is the lifts. Um, I've seen a bunch of questions come up about lifts. I won't throw out my recommendation because I am extremely biased um, and Katie wants to keep these very broad. But what I will throw out there, and I, that's no shot against Katie, sorry, I didn't mean to make that sound like a <laughs> um, I think it's very great that we're doing these this way. Um, one thing that I will throw out is, is that I absolutely think that, um, I'm trying to figure out the phrases. One of the things that I do not like about a lot of the lifts that are currently out there is the same reason that we're putting patrons at risk and putting staff at risk by sometimes allowing them or in very few cases expecting them to help with transfers um, is is that we're also putting them at risk by having movable lifts the example i use when i talk to people about this is if you sent your 16 year old staff member to the grocery store to work back shift to fill the shelves and you told them to go back and grab a skid of campbell's soup on the trolley and hey, it weighs 500 pounds, but the roof leaked last night um, and you got to take your shoes off and do it bare feet. Um, but hey, go get it done. This is what we do and what I see on a lot of pool decks with movable pool lifts. We're expect a lot of times no one has thought about this stuff. They haven't thought to say, oh, we should probably have a policy that says lifeguards shouldn't be helping with transfers. We probably should have a policy that says lifeguards shouldn't be moving the 400 pound lift across the pool deck in bare feet. Again, back to that uneven pool deck, we're moving a lift across the pool deck that's wet, it's uneven, and most of the time the guards are in bare feet. I have seen some facilities that have footwear for it, um, or you know the maintenance staff are the only ones that are allowed to move it, and I applaud those places. 
But unfortunately, in lifeguarding, a lot of times we get left behind on the occupational health and safety side when it comes to lifting and moving things. And movable accessibility lifts is one of the areas where I see it happening a lot, where the laws are being completely ignored because no one's just thought, oh, hey, we should probably have a policy for this. You know, like I said, we would think it's completely unreasonable to have that kid stock a shelf in bare feet with a leaky roof and drag around a skid of 500 pounds of canned soup. But to bring the pool lift out on the pool deck, hey, that one's fair game. So, you know, make those policies and think about those things and try to protect your staff and try to protect your patrons and make everybody safer and happier with their experience. Yeah, I think that's a huge, sorry. <laughs> that's a huge point is, is, a lot of people, and I, I, it took me a long time, Adrian, I'm sure you know this, to come around to your position. We are, Adrian and I are, I think, great friends at this point, but I have disagreed with him on some things until I have sorted out in my own brain why that is. And I think the soup analogy would have been a lot easier like a couple months ago to bring me around to this um, because I think it's, it's true. I mean, how many of your facilities have steel-toed rubber boots or steel-toed footwear that is suitable, whether you're moving a starting block, whether you're moving a a lift with you know 500 pound cinder block weights what does that look like i mean i know for myself the only time i ever sent a staff member home in the middle of their shift was because i told them to get steel toed boots and they wouldn't and i said you're done you're leaving like because they were trying with the wet floor after a swim meet to navigate a lift around the deck so uh, i think that's a that's a consideration um, I do want to mention, because Adrian won't mention it, because I have said, you know, the goal of these webinars is they're not product placement. They are representations of people, though. And I will tell you, so Adrian does, representation that is responsible for bringing pool Canada. That is that exists. You can research your fit something and we'll leave it and learn region about lifts. So find all of it and all lift to talk. The research is not cool. You can tell me about just don't listen to just lifts. Um you know what are considerations before they jump into anything just generally like researching options in your experience. Sorry, Katie, your internet totally went wonky there and then totally oh. sped up. Can you uh, can you repeat yeah. your question? Yeah, sorry about that. Question in short was if somebody is starting the process of looking for a lift, let's say they have a grant, and let's say they recognize this is an issue at their facility, they're not meeting what they'd like to be doing, what are some basic steps they could take You've mentioned ground building, looking at other aspects of the building, but what are some basic steps people could start to take to consider making changes, whether it's a lift or otherwise? Um, I think one of the most important things is once you start identifying that you're in need of it, is to also go and find people in your community. Um, get the input from them. Uh, they're the ones that you want as a customer. So find out what they need to come be a customer at your facility. Um, much like I was saying, people are, you know, kind of primed to fight their way through this stuff. Sometimes they're also super eager to be able to give some input and be involved in the process and be like, hey, like, you know, this is what would really make it easier for me to bring my son to come swimming here. Um, and I had one of those conversations the other day on the pool deck and the lady was just totally ecstatic that somebody would listen to her. Um, you know, and I don't have anything to do with management. I was just asking her basically trying to find out how they were finding using the hippocamp wheelchair, um, you know, to go down the ramp and stuff and just kind of be friendly. Um, you know, but she was very eager to try and be involved and, you know, help steer, you know, the board of directors or the disability committee, committee, whatever they had there that they needed, she was, she was happy to, you know, get involved if she could. And eventually after more talking realized, you know, that she was actually kind of, kind of pissed off that nobody had asked her. Um, and, you know, she's there all the time and she's been offering, but nobody takes advantage of that. So, you know, try and, try and find the people in your community that are going to benefit from it and find what they'd like to have, what, what will make it easier for them to get in. We all listen to the to the uh, 
to the moms that want and the dads that want more features for the kids to play on. So let's go listen to the 20% of the community that, you know, has a disability. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's not just, uh, sorry, it's not just lists, right? Like, I think I want to go back to your point, Adrian, quite a bit earlier, the example you gave at the start of the talk, for those of you who weren't here, uh, Adrian described how he'd done construction on his house and his hands were swollen. So he was unable to open the uh, iPad case cover before going through airport security and that he as apparently able-bodied individual male young individual was getting you know attitude lack of understanding for being unable to physically open something and I just want to remind people that you know a wheelchair or a cane or let's say um, the, the stick forgive me that people use when they're visually impaired those are cues but they're not all of the cues right so people who maybe should be using canes they don't want to use canes because of the stigma right? I could be otherly abled and I can't tell, right? Visual, cognitive, emotional. So let's not limit ourselves to just the mobility piece, right? In terms of accessibility. And Adrian's talked quite a bit about that. Uh, yeah, please, do you have anything? Yeah, most, um, you know, most communities now, or at least, you know, provinces, states, there's some form of uh, adaptive sports association, or Paralympic Association, et cetera. Um, if you don't know where to ask, those are probably good places to start. Um, you know, they often know of what resources other facilities may have, uh, what equipment is on loan. So they can also help steer the need too. They, again, the organization may not be the people that come to your pool, but they may have, may, they may be a little closer to those people and have already gotten that feedback to hear hey, we really wish that, you know, there was more all-terrain wheelchairs so we could take little Johnny to the splash park in the summer, you know, and, you know, you you might get that feedback and find out the pieces that are really worth spending the budget on because all of it is worth spending the budget on, but you got to start somewhere and you got to buy the pieces that you know right off the bat that people are going to be like, oh, hey, this this would be this is going to get used as soon as we buy it. People are going to be booking it out, or they're going to come use it. Um, and another great point there from Kim, physio and physio departments. They yeah, they would be another great one. Uh, the rehab centers at your local hospital and stuff. They would be good uh, resources as well. If nothing else, they're at least going to pass you on and tell you like, oh hey, here's a member in the community, or here's somebody that does a lot of stuff. They'll have some great feedback for you. The other thing I, I want to uh, briefly mention it, that I see, I've probably been to 100 pools in the last year. Oh, I think we have an echo, Adrian, so you got to mute my... <laughs> Sorry. Um, one of the things I want to mention, we still have 100 people on the call, so if you have questions, please pop them in the chat box there's no stupid questions really truly we want to kind of have this dialogue for those of you that may not have considered these things before but the number one thing that drives me crazy that i don't post on instagram because i don't want to shame these facilities but i try and have these conversations is how many of you store your lifts with the bag cover on top how many of you store your lifts not plugged in how many of you store your lifts not at the pool edge but in a corner or off deck or in a you know in a storage area how many of you don't have spare batteries? I visited a client a couple months ago, didn't even know that the battery was sold separately on their SR Smith PAL2, didn't have a battery, right? How many of you have tried your, um, your buttons? So emergency, sorry, not emergency, accessibility door buttons that they're unlocked in the morning. How many of you have actually tried to lower your lift into the pool with a lifeguard, getting the lifeguards to use the controls if you're telling them that they need to lower customers who are already transferred, but how many of you have had them try to do it so that it doesn't bang into the wall or jolt the customer, right? How many of you are doing that at your facilities? Many facilities I visit are not, right? They're in a bag over in the corner. And my own manager a couple of years ago when I bought a lift, we had a grant said, well, why are we spending $10,000 when nobody comes here, right? We don't use the existing lift. So why would we replace embarrassing pneumatic hand crank lift with something that's fourteen ten thousand dollars well because nobody's coming because we don't have a dignified option right yeah and i think that's a really important one because that is a thing that i hear quite a bit 
and I apologize to American counterparts. You guys are probably chiming in a bit on that. You know, you it's good to see that people are saying their lifts aren't covered, that they're out, they're accessible. And I, you know, but what I'm running into a lot in Canada, I see a lot of that too. Well, why would we buy that expensive lift when no one uses the one that's here already? And it's like, oh, 20% of your community needs a lift. It's not like, it's not because the need isn't there. It's because nobody knows you have it. You know, when you buy a $10,000 drying rack for your life jackets, yeah, of course your management is not ever going to want to buy it again or fix it. But if you buy a $10,000 lift or whatever, you know, numeration of lift or anything that you put in your pool and people use it and people are excited about it and it makes the news and people are happy and people are telling their counselor about how much better it is, your boss and his boss and their bosses and their bosses and her boss they're all going to be very happy to give you more money to do that stuff again. Um, you know, one of the analogies I like to use, uh, Katie made a good point about, you know, lifts that are covered up. One of the ones that I see a lot, because we're not on the same page that like ADA requirements are. So they end up just in staff rooms and stuff is when you're trying to provide dignified access, that means that me coming in the pool and doing a cannonball into the pool, requires the same amount of intervention with staff that an individual that rides a wheelchair and wants to go in the pool. What does that look like? Well, that looks like if me and another person went to the front doors and we just arbitrarily said, hey, people that have blue sweaters, when you want to come in our facility, you press this button over here on the wall and then uh, Bob comes out with the tools and he takes the hinges off the door and he opens the door up and it'll let you walk through. But everybody else that has a normal colored sweater on, you all just get to walk through the door. Only blue shirts have to stop, ask for the person to come out, undo the door, get let in. Oh, and when you wanna leave, you gotta press the button again and let us know that you wanna go out and we'll, uh, we'll let you out of the building. That's what dignified access is. When you come to a facility and you have to ask the lifeguard for the lift and they have to go, okay, yeah, hold on a minute. And they've got a signal, do a rotation, get somebody to go get it. They drag it out of the staff room. They drag it across the pool deck. That is not dignified access. That's providing two tiers of stuff. And that's you telling people with disabilities that they're a lower class and a lower priority. So what I'm saying for seeking people out and for being dignified is people get to walk out on those decks and they get to use that lift by themselves. Um, and with the little asterisks on the end there that lifeguards have some form of overseeing power to ensure the safety, the, the path is clear, et cetera. But for the most part, our goal is to get to the least amount of interactions that an individual needs when they need to use a lift or other means to get in the pool that isn't just doing a cannonball. The less steps that that person has to use that is as close to somebody doing a cannonball as possible, that is as cl close to getting dignified access as you can get. Yeah, and I think, um, oh, I'm totally going to lose my train of thought. <laughs> um, where do you fall, Adrian? I know some facilities I have worked at when I was not in a management role, there was a strong preference from management for clients to call ahead to ensure better quality service, like the lift in place the doors are available but where do you fall in your perspective of as a management technique in an ideal world we don't want to do that um, because again it comes back to providing two tiers of access and putting people into a different class of uh, of, of person um, the reality of that is is that yeah as we start to transition in some of these uh, areas that have lower budgets and whatnot, the reality is, is that they're probably going to have to have that relationship with those uh, patrons and try to navigate it as dignified and best as possible. Um, but ideally we want to be at a situation where people don't have to call ahead where they, you know, they're dealing with everything else to get there and that when they get there, it just works and they get in and they do whatever they need to do. You know that the the change is ready ready and available at the lift is operational that day um 
you know, the reality is, yeah, in some places, um, because of budget restrictions, they may have to have, you know, uh, a lift move from one pool to another, depending on what pool that person wants to use or, or whatever. But, you know, to try and navigate those as best as possible in the cases, but the ideal situation is to move to, to where we don't have to have those compromises. Um, let's circle back. We had a question quite a while ago. Uh, so sometimes people mentioned in the chat, so management is not on board with, you know, purchasing a lift or doing uh, retrofits or upgrades. What kinds of uh, conversations or points would you give to, let's say there's an aquatics person in this chat still, we've got 95 people here. They're saying, you know what, my facility, it's old and it's really, it's not friendly, but I want to do what I can. And I need to convince my managers, my directors that this is you know, we're seeking out these clients, these customers, beyond the financial statistics, like the number of, re the amount of revenue, what kind of talking points would you give to somebody to say, to start that conversation with management and say, this is a priority, this is what I wanna do in the pool and for our clients? Um, I would generally direct them to, you know, what's going on for regulations elsewhere. Uh, and if you're an American facility and you're trying to get it, is just, you know, look up the ADA requirements and use that as ammo and just go, hey guys, like, look, we, we really need to do this. Um, you know, and here's what it is. And I really think that if we went ahead and did some extra, you know, if we thought about how we implement this, we'll get more clients out of it. Um, for Canada, I would use the, uh, I would roughly, you know, say, tell, them, take, uh, tell them to take a look at um, the Ontario legislation um, or the Rick Hansen Foundation. Uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation has a great um, uh, vibe and flavor to what they present and how they want the world more inclusive. Um, generally though, like, Basically, as long like if if you're stuck against somebody that's stubborn and you just keep pushing, we have yet to see a customer that's gone and asked um, council for money get turned down. Um, there, you know, with the stats that are out there, the twenty percent of the community is is uh, needing this stuff, and well, they're still paying taxes. So there isn't a counselor or a mayor out there that's going to go on the record and say, no, we don't need to give any money to that. That's like, that's career suicide. Um, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, like if you have to push, you can push and just be like, listen, 20% of your constituents want, you know, need access. Like, let's get it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the worst case scenario. I'd like, I'd say try and use the, the positive resources, try and look for those stories, like the ones I mentioned about like the grocery store chains. Um, the, the COVID situation that we're in right now is, is kind of actually really good for advancing the accessibility thing um, because we just watched major grocery chains in Canada turn around and say, yeah, you know what? The first hour of every day is only open to seniors and people with uh, health, health issues. And you guys get the seniors discount that you would normally only get on Tuesdays for that whole hour. Um, you know, so there's a great example to show like, hey guys, like, and look, let's go sit at the grocery, you don't believe me? Like, let's go sit at the grocery store for an hour in the morning. Let's see how many clients go in. Like, those are people that could be clients in our pool for Aquasize. Like, you know, here's people that aren't coming to our facility. So you can use those good news stories of like, hey, you know, the sensory friendly shopping hour that, you know, grocery stores put in, how people are reacting to this. The other side to that that you can use right now, um, and I made a post about it on Facebook a little while ago, uh, you know, most of us in the last couple of weeks, we have all of a sudden just experienced what Katie asked about a couple of minutes ago about, you know, what if a customer is being asked to call in? With these COVID restrictions that are coming in, we've had as able-bodied people that are normally never restricted on anything we've ran into a lot of the same restrictions that people experience every single day living with a disability um we you know for me the other day i was running around as all these restrictions were starting to come in i started hoarding supplies for building my house knowing that i was going to get locked down i was like oh well, i'll just make sure i have all the materials and i'll just keep working on my house you know one of the places that i frequent as a business had closed their doors 
And now their policy was I had to call in advance, I had to place the order, and they had to put it out on the curb for me. That's the same procedure that would have been used at a lot of other businesses who don't have a properly accessible front entrance for a, for a wheelchair. So all of a sudden, here I was as a fully able-bodied person with the light bulb going on of like, oh, I, I have to do this at one, one place today and I'm okay with it because of what's going on in the world, like no big deal. But this is what most people live with all of the time. So, you know, that's a way to really give a, a real world example of what most people have gone through right now. And for them to be like, oh yeah, you know what? It was kind of inconvenient when I wanted to get my, you know, my Thai food and the guys just left it sitting on the doorstep over yeah. front and I had to like call and pay for it in advance and stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, well, that's how everybody that rules the wheelchair in your community goes and gets their whatever brand of food inserted here every time they want to go out. That's what's happening every time they want to come and use the wheelchair, uh, the, the accessibility lift into our pool. They're calling in advance. They're making sure we set it out. So you can start to get people to be like, oh, I get it now. Yeah, yeah, I went through that. Okay, I understand. Um, so it brings a bit of that empathy back to them. I think just to circle back to what you were saying, Adrian, I think a, a piece um, politically, like you said, a lot of um, councillors or city managers, they may be unwilling to say no when a rate payer says, well, we need a lift or we need these renovations or we need these accommodations. Yes, I understand in 2020 with the COVID situation that budgets will be slashed and grants are going to disappear and the economy is not going to be very good. But speaking from my own experience, when I got the grant at my last municipal facility for a lift, it really wasn't a lot of paperwork. I didn't have to demonstrate demand for a lift, an accessibility lift, quite to the degree I might have for a larger project that was more nebulous. This was a lift and it was easily approved. After the lift was approved and I put the little plaque on there with the naming rights, then the calls started pouring in from other people that would have funded the lift. So I think something to be aware of is if you take the mercenary side of things, there are going to be businesses in your area, in your region or foundations that will jump at the chance to fund this sort of thing. Yes, COVID being a financially um, difficult time for many people. It may not be this month. It may not be this year, but there is there is money out there for these things. So do a little bit of research if you can, not that we all have spare time right now. Um, grant writing doesn't have to be very difficult if you can demonstrate very basic need in your community with some of the statistics. So Adrian mentioned one in seven. There was a comment in the chat box that in the USA, it may already be one in five. Right, especially if you have an elderly population area or other specific schools or specific resources, it may be higher. Um, circle back as well, um, Adrian mentioned the Rick Henson Foundation. So Rick Henson being a famous Canadian athlete for our American audience. So his foundation also issues different grades, I believe, to different types of facilities. So that could be a way to distinguish your facility if you're in a competitive market and say, not only do we put our photos online of our facility, our change rooms, our hallways, our ramps, so that people can choose to use our facility, but we provide better service and we provide better quality resources. And we've actually sought out a Rick Hansen Foundation certification for our facility to be listed on their directory. I mean, that's a very high level commitment, but doing something like that could really make a difference in your, in your community and how your community or your facility is recognized regionally. Well, and to like two points on that for like budget ways. Um, one, and I hope nobody takes this the wrong way right now, but from municipal standpoints, we just saved a whole ton of money for like the last month since we sent all the lifeguards home. Um, I know it's terrible to say, but you have all those wages uh, that are didn't get used. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good time that if you have to, you could reallocate those to those infrastructure pieces for your facility if you needed to. Um, the other side of that budget is like you're saying, Katie, you know, yeah, budgets are going to get tight. And if, you are trying to get the same amount of money and trying to get more money out of the same customers all the time. Um, you're only going to get so much of that. And if you can't change the facility, if you can't change the customer base or like the, the regular customer's income and threshold for what they'll pay, you need to bring in different customers. So if you are looking at things like, yeah, the Rick Hansen one, that's where they start to really look at those 
how all the pieces work together. Those designations, yeah, if you go and, and go after that, now all of a sudden you're chasing, you know, upwards of 20% of your community that may not have, you know, looked at your facility before. So if budgets are tight, revenues low, here's a way that now you're chasing new customers to come into your facility and you're saying, listen, like, come on in guys, we want you. Like, here's what we've done to show you that we want you. Come be our customer. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a new revenue source. So even outside of the humanitarian side of it, think about accessibility from the revenue side that don't just, you know, that's where I come from when I say don't accommodate people, seek them out as customers is, you know, how can we bring those customers in? You know, it's not just to make you feel good and do the humanitarian thing. You're also a business. So, you know, go after those customers, go show them you want them. I think the, other thing we need to mention that I was unaware of myself as somebody who grew up in a city, but those of you that are in urban areas, there are, even in rural areas or in any area for that matter, people will travel for a better facility. The same way people will travel for their favorite restaurant or they'll travel for their fav favorite hobby or sport, right? So when I moved from Ontario to Alberta, I moved to a small town in Northern Alberta and we were the closest pool for 45 minutes in one direction and an hour and a half in another direction. And I remember at one point I met a gentleman from a town 45 minutes away that had a pool. And I said to him, well, why would you drive 45 minutes to our pool? And he said, your staff are nicer and you have a lift. And I said, well, you should, you should tell as a, as a rate payer, you should tell your pool in town to get a lift. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. You're driving 45 minutes, three days a week for your rehab. Uh, old farmer, very, you know, very, um, you know, just passionate about staying healthy, but older. And he just said, yeah, I don't even want to have the conversation. I shouldn't have to have the conversation. I'm just going to drive to your pool. And we started as we became in that old facility, um, as we became better known for our service and our accessibility. And I had a colleague who was very passionate about accessibility. We at one point were having people drive from an hour, hour and a quarter away past other pools to come to our facility. So I want to urge you guys as well in urban areas, if there's multiple competing pools, people will pick your pool whether you're aware of it or not certainly when we talk anything other than swimming lessons or wait lists if if there's a choice let's say for me to use adrian's pool with a lift and i need it or to go to a pool i've never been to if i'm with my husband we're going to go to the pool with the lift but in rural and suburban areas you guys really need to understand that people they may choose not to use you or they may choose to use you and drive from quite a ways so don't just be limited by the revenue in your tax base. There may be county revenue, there may be neighboring county, neighboring regional revenue that you can draw upon. And that's certainly what we experienced in that Northern community in my second and third year was our revenue grew well past what our population base was. Our town was 2,500, our county was 7,000. The revenue we were growing at was well beyond what was in our, our area. And I don't think it had ever occurred to my manager of recreation or the director of community services that a pool could have that kind of draw, but it really does. Um, on a similar note, I'll steal one of Ryan's feel good stories uh, from one of our things. When we were selling uh, the lift that we sell, um, we, uh, when we originally brought it, the idea to Canada and we're starting to petition people, uh, and I, I hopefully don't butcher his story too bad, uh, in an, a major Alberta municipality, uh, they had chosen to give him a seat at the table and let him talk. And the disability committee was in there and they actually had a gentleman um, in a wheelchair, sorry, riding a wheelchair at that meeting who had very similar comments and it was based on the quality of the lift. Um, mm -hmm. He had spoke up and said that the first pool that our lift went into he would go swimming for the first time in a very long time and he hadn't been frequenting pools because the lifts they were using were so undignified. Um, so very similar to your guy that just the fact that it was going to be a lift that he felt excited to use, he voiced and said, I don't care where it is in the city. If you guys put mm -hmm. that lift in, the first one that goes in, I'm coming swimming. You know, and I've heard similar comments here in Nova Scotia for another place um, that uh, actually it was somebody who had come to me as a potential customer and she was telling me that she had heard feedback from other people that were like yeah we drive all the way across the city just to come to this facility that has the lift that you guys uh, had sold 
and they're driving that far just to use that lift so we want one and you know we we want to get customers that think like that and i was like yeah good glad you you know thanks for the feedback because i hadn't heard that from the customers but you know so people will search out those those things so if you advertise it the you know those are great examples of seeking out customers instead of just accommodating them so i i want to start to wrap up unless we have questions because i see we still have quite a lot of people here so if there's something that you would like from us we're happy to provide it in terms of resources or discussion you'd like us to have um the whole genesis of this session was adrian i've known for a year or two now we got connected through instagram and yeah he really pushes the envelope i think in a way that a lot of us um, so me as an introvert, like not, I don't like, you know, big, flat, like loud people, but it, it really is a conversation we need to have in terms of how we're addressing or not addressing. And I don't want you to leave with any of these webinars. I don't want you to leave thinking, oh my goodness, this is another thing I have to add to my workload. I don't have any money. My manager doesn't buy in. What am I going to do? I'm discouraged before I even start. I mean, I want you to start thinking, what are some basic things you can do? Maybe you incorporate a 15 minute session in in-service talking about your experience or you find some activities online, or when you get back into the pool, you go through that navigation activity Adrian mentioned. How is it to navigate our facility in a wheelchair or with a cane or you know, supporting another individual? Simple steps, I don't want you to get overwhelmed and do nothing, right? Uh, any action is better than inaction, so if you have further questions, Adrian has said that he'll share his contact information in the show notes. Um, you can find him on Facebook. You can find him other ways. He is a great resource. He's done a great session. I really appreciate and want to thank him for providing this session. Um, he does represent a lift. He does represent pool pods. If you want to buy a pool pod, all the power to you, right? But the point of this session was really to get you thinking about other ways that we are limiting ourselves and that accessibility doesn't have to be a bad word and something that we're scared of or something that we just don't want to deal with, right? It really is a customer base, a revenue source, a um, an opportunity. And so we hope we can provide you that value from this session. Uh, today is Monday. I hope to have this session uploaded by the end of day tomorrow, Tuesday. The show notes are already pinned uh, in the chat box. Um, I will give Adrian a last chance to add anything else in just a moment. Last call for questions, please. If you're having any issues registering for future webinars, please make sure that you're using a personal email address if you're finding you're not getting the invitations. So I've spoken to a few people today where they're professional firewalls. Let's say they're at home retrieving email via a server for their employer there are firewalls that are preventing you from getting the invitations so consider using a personal email address if you're still having those challenges or reach out to me via email and i can get you um, invited to the event but that seems to be the consistent feedback is that there's firewalls and servers involved adrian do you have any final thoughts you want to add no i'm pretty good for now i'll let people get going because we're kind of way over on time so what where else do we have to be i mean really i have a one o'clock phone call in eight minutes so that's me driving this bus but i got a I got a uh, dog that's been walking in here on and off bugging me so <laughs> all right thank you guys thanks everyone if you join us on wednesday we'll be back with paul macias from farmers branch uh, aquatic center thank you so much your when your wednesday monday it is still monday somewhere <laughs> monday april 6th thank you so much we'll see you again have a great rest of your day be patient with yourself and we'll speak soon bye bye